One, two, one, two, three, four. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Jacobs, founder of the New York Revenue Collective. Before we start, a quick thank you to this month's Sales Hacker Podcast sponsor, Node. Node's AI discovery platform can understand the meaning, context, and connection between any person or company by proactively surfacing opportunities that are highly relevant and personalized in real time. Node is creating an entirely new paradigm for sales and marketing professionals to grow pipeline and accelerate revenue velocity. Visit info.node.io forward slash sales hacker to learn more. And now on with the show. Welcome everybody to the Sales Hacker Podcast. It's your host, Sam Jacobs. Today we've got a great show. We've got Emmanuel Scala. Emmanuel, well known in the startup ecosystem. She's been doing this and building businesses for the last 18 years. She's currently VP of Customer Success at Toast, but she's also served in a number of other client-facing functions and revenue-generating functions. She led sales and success at DigitalOcean. She was also VP of Sales at Influitive, uh, where she scaled the organization over 10x. Previously in her career, she was at Indeca, which was acquired by Oracle for a billion dollars, and Vertica, which was acquired by HB. So, Emmanuel, we're so excited to have you. Welcome. Thanks, Sam. Excited to be here. So first thing we want to know is your baseball card. So we know your name is Emmanuel Scala. Do you ever have any nicknames, by the way? (laughs) Uh, L, E L L E. Okay. So I saw that an email once and I wanted to know if I could write an email that said L because I love it. Yeah, go for it. That's all right. It's a lot. I mean, Emmanuel is kind of a mouthful. So (laughs) (laughs) it's beautiful. What's your current title? Vice President of Customer Success. And where are you working? Toast. Yeah. Well, tell us about it. What kind of company is it? What do you guys do? We sell a restaurant platform to, uh, you know, sort of to restaurants, obviously. We sell mostly to S&D restaurants, but we also sell to S- uh, enterprise and, um, and mid-market restaurants. And it's a full suite of every piece of software that a restaurant would need from their POS system, all their back office, inventory management, online ordering, scheduling of resources, et cetera. So it's like the, uh, the full suite solution for restaurants. Pretty okay. cool. It's cool space. Something I've never done before um, into this industry, but uh, it's it's cool because you. It's something that you know. I go out to restaurants and I you know I see my product um, in a place where you know I'm also there for personal time. So it's neat. It is, and I imagine it's probably fair. You know, you've been doing enterprise sales. You've done channel sales. This sounds like it's you know sort of high velocity transactional selling. Is that accurate or or no? It's definitely high velocity transactional. It's also in market, right? And so that's also really different. Um, is most of our reps are in their market, in their geographic market, and so it's a, a localized sale for the most part. And it's also a localized uh, delivery, like a services delivery. Um, so that's pretty unique as well. Localized services delivery. Do you mean like on-prem? So no, what I mean is no, it's, it's definitely a cloud-based solution. But what I mean is that we're, we actually have people post-sale um, doing the on-site installations and training and... Oh, like, wow. Interesting. This sounds like a business where lining up the unit economics is very, very important and you need a great CFO. And we do have a great CFO. <laughs> uh, but yeah, lining up the unit economics is pretty important. But we have pretty phenomenal unit economics. So. Yeah, I think that's, we're, we're a hardware business and a software business, um, and we're also the credit card processor. So um, there's, we have uh, three, three revenue streams. Oh, wow. Okay. And how big is Toast? Give us a range just so we can frame it appropriately. Uh, we're a private company, so we don't do revenue range, um, but I can tell you that it's, it's significant and it's, you know, we're doubling every year. So we have published our fundraising so that's something that I can share. The, our Series C, which we closed this past summer, was 101 million. Um, you, you raised 101 million. That was the Series C. So over total, uh, it's over 150. Um, wow. but the okay. Series C was 101 million. That was done this this past spring. Very good. That's impressive. Yeah, the post money on 100 million is significant. So um, I'm yeah. sure that you guys are well north of uh, 50 million. Hopefully, what's the size of your organization? So you run customer success. How big is that? 300 people. 300 people. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the company is 850. Uh, we've grown really fast. We were at about 300 a year ago. Um, and now we're 850. And the, the, the two biggest teams are the sales team um, and then the customer success team. Now, customer success people often think of it as you know, just sort of your CSMs or your you know, quote-unquote account managers 
that I have a lot more than just that and, and here at Toast. So my team is composed of five different departments. So we have our services team, which does all the installation and, and deployments. And then we have our support team, which is your you know sort of traditional 24-7 support. And then I have your customer success team. You know, what you would typically think of as customer success, we call it restaurant success, which are your relationship managers, essentially. And then I have our customer education team. And then the last one is our customer experience team. Wow. That's a lot of teams. Did all of those teams exist prior to your arrival? Did you create those teams? What was, I'm interested in the organizational design hypothesis that led to all of these elements. Yeah. So some of them did, um, and some of them are new. The customer success wasn't an umbrella organization as it is now. My role is new to the company. The departments were reporting straight up to the CEO prior to my arrival in, in September. So the services team has always existed you know, and, and, and with a pretty similar mission to take our customers live. Um, the support team has also always existed with a similar mission to support the inbound requests that are coming in and questions that are coming in. Um, I've changed the mission of the account management team to be much more consultative and proactive, created a very customer-focused education team and created the customer experience team. And why? I mean, you know, we just, there's a couple of reasons. Services, like I said, support didn't change on the kind of relationship management side or what people typically refer to as customer success. The team previously was really reactive and almost like um, an extension of support. And what I was recognizing was that our customers, what they really wanted was, especially our customers who had been using the product for four or five, six years, they, they didn't have a great way outside of your normal you know, email communications and you know, some marketing road shows and events that we did to really understand what's new in Toast and how can they, base, you know, they best take advantage of our technology? How can they get the most value out of it? You know, how do they, do they understand our partner ecosystem? All those things, we really needed a team that was focused on value realization and also upselling because as we scale our product, we're adding more and more capabilities to the product. Um, and our sales team is you know, primarily focused on winning new business. And so that's why I you know, rebranded to Restaurant Success and I kind of changed the mission of that team. And then the, the education team... You think POS is an easy thing to understand, but education of our of you know how to use a cloud-based system and how to take advantage of all the you know all the various attributes of the system is something that we have to be create uh, and put a lot of attention on. So that is a, a team that now reports um, through me because it's pretty strategic. And then the last one is the experience team. I'm a big believer in in MPS and like I especially in an industry like the restaurant industry where the restaurant owners are are a tight knit community. We're a very company. Um, they talk you know, to each other all the time. You know, they're opening new restaurants and, and they're recommending products to their friends. And so having someone focus on customer experience and improving the MPS and having a small team do that was, uh, is, I think, pretty critical to building a company that's going to scale. So the customer experience team, how are they different than, I guess, the account management team? They don't, they don't own accounts, so they don't have you know, a portfolio of accounts that are, are theirs. They look across every department, not just in my own department, but they look across product and finance and marketing and sales in every department and look at, are there ways that we can improve the customer experience? Are there ways that we can... Essentially, the, the, the key metric for them is our MPS score. So you know, maybe it's the sales to services handoff, my right, needs improvement, or maybe it's how we set expectations, or maybe it's how quickly we RMA a piece of hardware. Um, you know, the woman who leads that team talks about often talks about the makers and the breakers. Right? There's there's certain moments, and there's a book I recently read called The Power of Moments, which I think is great, and um, we use some of the material in that to think about how moments in a in a customer life cycle can really make or break the experience. And sometimes it's like the smallest moment that can make the biggest difference or the opposite, which is it's the smallest moment that can ruin a relationship. Um, and you wouldn't think, oh, well, someone's going to churn or get angry over this small little moment. But for them, that moment is critical. So identifying what those moments are and making sure that we're doing the best we can in the makers and, the, and that we're improving and, and uh, not letting the things that could break a relationship or break you know, trust with our customers um, that, you know, that those things aren't existing and they aren't getting in the way of business results. Uh, that's really interesting. And so the sale happens, the handoff is to essentially, is it, is it an onboarding team? Yeah, essentially. Um, it's a multi-step process. Um, 
when you, if you're a restaurant, your, your POS system is your, your heart and soul. I mean, you're taking all your orders through that. It's, you know, has all your menu, uh, you're running all your entire business, all your, you know, your cash and your credit card transactions are going through. It's a complex implementation, but yeah, essentially it goes to our services team who is responsible for the onboarding, the installation, deployment, and training. That's incredible. So, you know, I'm curious, you have built your career uh, previously to Toast being responsible for new business generation and, and formally being designated, you know, the head of the sales function. And yeah. I know that you've run success in the past, clearly, but walk us through, you know, the, your thought process when you're thinking about your next step in your career and how you decided to take this role with Toast and why, you know, what the pluses and minuses were of specifically focusing and designating it customer success. Yeah, uh, that's it's a great question. It's been a bit of a journey, right? And I think it's I'm, I'm not going to go belabor with my whole background, but I will say that I kind of even got into sales in a in a bit of, of an unusual way to begin with. My early pre even being in software sales background was all it was in operations, and then I moved into you know, I kind of parlayed that into sales operations, and then I parlayed that into um, running sales. And for a long time in my career, I was looking at sales from a very operational way. Right? So I was looking, I, I ran channel sales um, at a company for five years um, because yeah, channel is an efficient way to go to market. Um, I ran inside sales for a number of years because inside is an efficient way to go to market. I joined DigitalOcean and was responsible for sales there. And that's a product-led model. And again, another efficient way to go to market. So I spent at this trend of looking for, you know, what's, what are the most efficient ways of going to market right? because of my operations background. And one of the, the things that I realized, and it was that influitive that it really struck me, was that in this aspiration, especially in SaaS and how much SaaS has taken off in the last 10 years, right? That we have this like, fascination and aspiration with efficiency of our go-to-market model. And, but we were often doing it at the expense of the customer experience, right? And at the expense of NPS or happy customers. Um, and it's only been recently when you've had these like super viral products and the like, product led models, you know, like Slack or DigitalOcean or others that have started to, you know, get back to, okay, your, our goal is to, you know, create raving fans, you know, as a business. But I think that got lost in sort of the early days of SaaS. And what I noticed is that the more we were focused on efficiency, the more we were seeing bad customer experience, right? And that was starting to show up and churn. And then, you know, you, five years ago, you know, you look at any VC and what people were writing about, and it was all about, you know, your funnel and, and your cat to LTV and how do you make sure you're looking at your LTV and how does your churn play into that, et cetera. And then the, the customer success was then born, right? As a function, not only to, you know, to take customers live or to onboard them or to make them successful, but, you know, frankly, a lot of the reasons why it was created was churn prevention, <laughs> you know, because companies started having these leaky buckets. Um, and it just sort of dawned on me that like, well, have we swung the pendulum too far? And, you know, is there a way that we can have both a highly efficient go-to-market model and, right, you know, have happy customers? I started to get more and more fascinated with how do you have both, right? And how do you generate happy customers? And like I said, Influitive sort of kicked this, this off for me because we were in the business of creating advocate programs, you know, which is all about leveraging your customers to help scale your business. And you can't do that unless you have advocates. So that led me to think, well, maybe, you know, a blend of customer success and, and sales is, is really the right thing. And we can talk more about my thinking on where the, the industry overall is headed. Toast, I've been talking to Toast for a while. These are ex-colleagues from Indeca, so I've known what they've been up to. And one day, the, you know, who's a friend of mine called me and said, I have a crazy idea. You know, we'd love to bring you in to Toast, the go-to-market model, and the, the sales leadership is, is amazing here. Um, like, but how about running customer success? And it was for me, it was the right time because I was starting to get really intrigued by this notion of you know, kind of, can you have your cake and eat it too? And as a sales leader who was pretty obsessed with trying to figure out how to have a great customer experience already, it kind of seemed like a no-brainer. So I jumped full-blown into the post-sales side of the world, um, and it's been the last six months. Well, you know, I still miss... There's some things about sales I, I miss, absolutely. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying that this is forever for me, but right now, it's what do, great. The, what do you think the biggest differences are? So, you know, now that, again, in DigitalOcean, I mean, I think almost all of the roles I've had recently, I am running both. And I'm sure there's benefits and disadvantages. 
now as somebody that is just focused on, obviously you're focused on the entire customer experience, but you're specifically focused on the post-sale moment, to use your word, yep. what are the biggest differences? I'm a cost center, not a revenue center right, right now. right? So like, that's a pretty big difference. And I, as an executive, I've never been as focused on margins and efficiency and other things as I am right now because sales honestly kind of can get away sometimes <laughs> with you know not being as efficient as uh, as you need to be as long as you're hitting your numbers. Sometimes boards and CEOs can, and CFOs can turn a little bit of a blind eye. So that's one that's pretty big. And d- does that mean that you're not... To, obviously, we don't need to know any of the numerical details, but that, for example, your plan, your personal plan is focused on margin or it's, it's a KPI of the business? How does margin make its way into sort of your operating dashboard? Yeah. So, I mean, I, one of the things I am measured on is margin. So I'm, I am measured on revenue because we are responsible for taking our customers live. And so that is a revenue number. So I have four metrics that I'm measured on. I'm measured on revenue, margin, and customer MPS, and employee MPS. So those are the things I care about. And the, the interesting, the, the, I think the tricky part is move employee MPS out for a second because every executive should own employee MPS. But what I find challenging about being on the customer success side, especially when I also have a revenue target, um, is the balance of the three, right? Is the balance of, you know, keep a high MPS and, you know, be efficient and drive revenue. And it's hard to find the right balance. It's really easy to keep a high MPS and have crappy margins, right? You just throw a lot of bodies <laughs> at a problem, right? right? Or it's easy to hit revenue targets and not your margin targets, you know, or hit revenue targets and, and not your MPS targets. But finding that right balance between how much effort you put into your MPS efforts and how much effort you put into your margins and your efficiency and how much effort you put into revenue. We are we're historically, my world, while yeah, as an executive, I had to watch costs and I had budgets and all those kind of things. But like, really, at the end of the day, if you're a sales leader, it's revenue, 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 and everything else is sort of third um, or fourth, uh, where it is absolutely not that here. It is a a very tight rope that I'm uh, uh, balancing those three in virtually equal, um, which is new for me. It's just yeah, kind of flexing skills in being watching efficiency and and margin and and PS more. Walk us through. I don't know if there's a specific example because I guess I think if you have the wrong product or if you have a product that's not ready to scale, then then none of those things are possible. Yeah. And I would think conversely, um, there's a balancing act at the stage that you guys are at. But walk us through some of the trade-offs that, that you think about. Is it maybe, for example, how hard to enforce an auto renewal clause? And you know, give us some examples. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it can be something like, what part of the customer journey do you automate and what part do you have white glove treatment, right? When you're selling to SMB, and especially in a, in a hospitality industry, which is what we're selling into, right? There's a high expectation of white glove treatment because that's how they treat their client with the white glove treatment. We can't necessarily afford to be as white glove with every single customer as we would, you know, ultimately like to, which would give us, you know, mind-boggling NPS scores, right? So we have to make decisions about what part of the customer journey are we going to give white glove treatment and what part of the customer journey are we not going to give white glove treatment, right? Um, and we're going to ask people to do self-service or other things, right? What are some examples there? Give like, us so this- one, one example would be, you know, when like the, the actual transition from one POS system to another, because this is all the financial heart and soul of, of a restaurant, that is a at those that first day, that first week when someone goes live, that process of relearning a system, especially if you're you know transitioning off of a legacy, which many of our customers are, that really does require you know in white glove you know uh, treatment. But you know, you call it you know a week down the road when they need to order a new printer. Right? Do we really? We don't need to have a you know a human being show up and you know hand deliver a printer. We could probably have them go online, order their printer, get it shipped never talk to a human being. Yeah. That's a decision, right? And you know that we had to make that says, all right, we're going to do the installations live and we're going to have people on site. Right? But you know, after the initial installation, we're going to um, use self-service and automation to support, you know, some of the transactional needs of our customers. Some people don't want to do uh, the onboarding as an example. Many com- many SaaS companies do onboarding virtual. And while we will we will and and do for certain class of customers that don't need the on-premise, you know, live in-person support, 
we don't believe that that for our business, we're willing to spend the money there. So that, those are the, some of the kinds of decisions that I have to think through is where do we want to spend our money? What value are we going to get out of it? What's the balance of how much is it going to cost us versus how much we're going to achieve in either an MPS or revenue you know, benefit? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, you've had the benefit of working at very small companies. You're now at what I would probably consider a medium sized slash large company. And I think one of the things some people might be thinking as they're hearing about all the different functions and roles within just the customer success organization is how do you know when to start building those teams? Given that you've seen the full spectrum of scaling size from probably pre product market fit all the way to where you're at now, what are your strategies or, or how do you think about? building those teams and when to build those teams and how you know it's the right time? Yeah, that's a good question. Somewhat depends on your model, whether you're you know, going to do a freemium or a free trial or product-led you know, self-service or whether it's an enterprise um, solution that requires um, a sort of super high touch go-to-market. So my answer would depend based on what your business model is. But in general... Even despite the business model nuances, which would lead me to one direction or another, is I think we invest in customer success too late. I actually was just listening this morning to Reid Hoffman has his Masters of Scale podcast. And it was um, this particular one was about the importance of early on, the importance of customers who love you and not, you know, just like you um, and how you can create viral effects and, uh, and network effects by just maniacally being focused on your, you know, 10 customers and making sure that they, you know, they absolutely love you. And then their next 100 customers, and then obviously the power of advocacy, they'll bring to you the next 100 and the next 100 and the next 100 and so forth. I think that customer that companies, even if you're super enterprise, and you have a really high touch, go to market model, if you don't have somebody who is whose goal is to sure this customer gets, you know, unbelievable value, from the product and the service and will be a raving fan, then you're absolutely missing an opportunity um, to 10x your business with a significantly less investment. The good, the, there was a, they gave a story in the podcast about um, the bakery in New York who sells, you know, the cronuts and like how he didn't put any effort into, he didn't market it. He didn't do any publicity stunts. He didn't do anything. He just had a out the door every day of hundreds and hundreds of people waiting to try a cronut. And then this created a phenomenon all over, you know, of people copying his cronuts, et cetera, just because of word of mouth and, you know, a couple happy customers at the very beginning. And then the way he continued to treat his customers as they were waiting outside in the line in the cold, delivering them hot chocolate, et cetera. So I think it's early, like really early. The more product led you are, the more self-service, then it's even potentially before sales. And obviously, the more kind of high touch your sales model is, and maybe at the same time. You're such a big proponent of NPS. And obviously, everybody wants, you know, a 70 or 80 or 90. But <laughs> yeah. How do you, you know, for you, what sort of green, yellow, red in terms of, you know, hey, things are going well, like we feel like we're still in good scaling mode, you know, the customers are still delighted versus actually we're starting to see some warning signs and maybe we need to go back and rethink our go-to-market strategy versus, hey, this is not the time to be investing in go-to-market. It looks like customers really don't like what we're doing. Are there numbers or proxies that you use to help inform those decisions? There are MPS standards that are um, across all industries of what's good, what's great, what's excellent. But the nuances within an industry are so different that it's really hard. Like if you, if you look at the you know, airline industry as an example, right? You know, the in the airline industry of thirty, it may be phenomenal, right? So you do have to compare yourself to your industry. That's one thing. I mean, in general, the kind of rough rule of thumb is anything below zero is not good. Uh, you know, zero to thirty is you know thirty to to 50 is good is, you know, doing pretty good. And, you know, like above 70 is amazing. Right. And, um, and sort of best in class. And now you're talking Nordstrom and Disney, you know, kind of best in class, but you do have to look at your industry. But I think more important than a, a number, because listen, like MBS is just one number. You could overemphasize any one number that, you know, you're, that you're looking at. Right. I think what's more important than the number that is the context. I don't like to get fixated on what number we are and how much it's gone up or down. Um, and we do do MPS every month. So we, we are do look at it and we care about it. But I want the context. So the, to me, it's the comments 
that you know are put in, or it's the feedback that we get when we do our post-survey follow-up. And we follow up with both the detractors and the promoters. And you know, if, if we don't get any kind of comments, and we, we listen and we learn about you know what's causing them to be a detractor or a promoter. And then we make, you know, just strategic decisions based off of that. So I don't really try to get fixated on the score. I try to get fixated on the, the commentary. And then also I correlate, you know, that the MPS data with other data. Like what is our support ticket data telling us? And what, you know, what are the anecdotal things we're hearing from sales? And we have an advocacy program here at Toast. And what's that telling us? I mean, you, you can't look at one thing in general to get a good pulse of where you are. But in general, if we feel like overall, we're starting to hear both anecdotal negativity and or there's, you know, a score is decreasing, then we quickly identify what we believe is the root cause and, you know, put project plans together to improve those areas of the customer experience. And then, you know, correlate, if we see any improvement. Um, and that could be, tickets on a certain topic topic, or it could be an NPS score or something else. I like your point about not focusing on, on one particular number. So I guess you mentioned earlier what your KPIs are, but if you're thinking about like an operating dashboard to provide you that pulse on overall health of the post-sale business, do you look at both unit retention and sort of, I guess, net revenue retention, including upsells? Do you look yeah. at all of it? Do you look at NPS? What are all the things that you're looking at? And I guess the other thing that I, I think is helpful to hear from you is what's a leading indicator from your perspective and a lagging indicator? Because I think a lot of times people get fixated on things that are so late in the life cycle of the, the phase that they're investigating it's not really as useful. Revenue is the least useful thing oftentimes to look at from the new, new business perspective. And churn is often the least useful thing because it's a thing that happens at the end. So walk us through sort of your operating dashboard. Yeah, no problem. So it's because of the, the varied nature of the de- different departments that I run. It's, there's very few things that are across all departments. The things that are across all departments are churn. Right? Like Everybody can have an, you know, has the ability to influence churn positively. Because there's a lot of folks out there that are not measuring churn the right way. Um, so how do you guys measure it? Uh, just, just so that everybody knows the exact calculation. So the exact calculation is we do we generally do revenue churn, but we also can do unit churn, right? Um, it kind of depends on your business, whether you want to do one or both. I encourage people to do both revenue churn and unit churn. It's the amount of revenue or units that have left the business that particular period over the total amount of revenue or units that you have um, in the company, right? We'll slice and dice it by uh, churn reason. You know, as you can imagine in the SMB world, we have, and in restaurant industry, we have a bunch of custom, restaurants that just, go, they, they go out of business. So we look at out of business churn versus non out of business churn, competitive churn, you know, so like we just, we look at a churn in different ways. Uh, what the most important thing about churn is, Obviously, the number is important and how you measure it's important, but why it's happening is, is the most important. And so if you can uh, have multiple categories, that's going to help you get a better indication of what's causing the churn so you can fix it. Yeah. So I interrupted you before. So that's churn. What else are you looking at? Obviously, NPS. NPS, we look across all of it. And on the um, revenue side, we look at live revenue, which is our booked revenue, um, or sorry, our build revenue post-installation. We also look at upsell revenue, which is separate. So we have a separate number for live and a separate number for upsell. And then obviously churn is another revenue impacting number. And then on the sort of efficiency side, we look at margin, cost of goods sold. And then I have quality metrics that I look at. And so that is things like, you know, uh, number of uh, tickets after a go live, you know, number of tickets overall by customer, because it can just indicate, you know, the quality of the the installation or the go live process. So those are the areas in general. And then, yeah, there's lots of support metrics. My right? first call resolution, and you know, time to answer a call, and CSAT and other things. But the high level ones are the ones I mentioned earlier. It's the rev- the ones that are tied to revenue, the ones that are tied to costs, the ones that are tied to um, MPS and quality. Was it hard? You mentioned that when you got to Toast, I guess, I don't know if it's the success team or specifically the account management team, but was, in your words, reactive. Was it difficult to shift the culture to a more proactive stance? And maybe even, you know, if you're focusing on upsells, to more of what might be called a sales orientation, when maybe some of the folks that joined the team were explicitly joining a success organization because they didn't want to be in sales? 
Uh, yes. <laughs> the <laughs> leading question. In progress. Um, <laughs> and it is, uh, yeah, it's been tricky. And I think, though, that that's, that's actually something that's going on, you know, at a macro level, too, right? Remember what I said before, right? So, like, customer success was created, uh, you know, out of SaaS, because the reality is you can lose your customer in, with SaaS when you're on a monthly or quarterly or annual subscription. You can lose your customer just as e- easily as you acquire, actually, more than you acquired your customer. You know, you kind of have to resell every day, you know, and make sure the customer is getting value. And so it was started that way, but it was started as a non-revenue focused job. The very first customer success team I remember was Salesforce. And they, it was all about best practices, right? You know, are you getting the most out of Salesforce, right? That was kind of the, the role. Of the, and then you added onboarding onto that, you know, over time. And then over time, then you added churn. So not churn, like retention, essentially. Like now, so now you have to onboard them. You have to make sure that they're using the product and their best practices and you got to keep them. And then we added upsell, you know, over time onto that. And overall, customer success is turning more and more and more into a revenue team, right? Especially for companies that, but based on their market dynamics or based on a product or something, potentially have a high degree of churn, right? So now you need your customer success team not to just onboard people and know the best practices, but you're constantly reselling. So you think about like if you lose a champion or uh, you know something in the, the, the dynamics of your customer changes, you're not just hey, how do you make sure you're, they're using the reporting as well as they can, but you're maybe going back to that executive sponsor and reselling the entire value of why they're there to begin with. So the skill set of the customer success person has absolutely gone overall in the industry and it's happening in a microcosm here at toast but it's gone from you know a more reactive you know more touchy feely you know support you know or customer service i should say type person to a much more revenue focused type person it's tricky to find and it's a tricky balance because if you're too revenue focused then you know you're going to lose trust with the customer, and you're not going to be able to potentially you know keep their business because they think you're going to you're so quota focused. But if you're not revenue focused at all, right, then you can be either wildly inefficient or give away the farm, or just not be able to either save or or upsell or get the, the most value you can. I think some companies are dealing with this in a bunch of different ways. One of them is they are maybe creating an account management team that is revenue focused, but some other part of the success or customer service organization that is not revenue focused yep. uh, and revenue incentivized. And then I, I think at the enterprise level, it's even more different because sometimes you're just saying the salesperson that sold the deal maintains that relationship, maybe into perpetuity, or at least for the first year. Have you seen those different models? And do you have a preference? And, and how do you think about that preference? I agree. I think the more what I've seen is definitely a bit of a convergence in the and I also like in, you pointed this out earlier, I definitely have seen customer success and sales starting to be under the same leader, right? So whether the individual contributors are different or not, I have seen more and more at the leadership level. I mean, the, the CRO title is kind of a fairly new title and often that's customer success and sales. And so I've definitely seen it at the leadership level. At the individual contributor level, it often depends on how product-led you are, how enterprise versus SMB or, or transactional you are, how much upsell is actually part... Some, some businesses don't have any ability to upsell. It's just a one and done, right? And so how much upsell do you, you know, have? What is the stickiness factor of your product? I and mean, those are probably going to make a difference in whether you need three people, one for new business, one for post-business, quote-unquote, sales, and one for like relationship and onboarding, or whether you're going to need even just one person, right? Some organizations are going to have one person, if they're really transactional, more product-led, this was at DigitalOcean, you didn't necessarily need to have a new business person and an onboarding person, a relationship person, and a post-sales revenue person. We could actually blend those all into, into one person. So I do think it, it very much depends on the, on the business model. But what I am saying is that as more and more companies are becoming product-led, and uh, then we're, we are starting to see those roles starting to consolidate down to potentially even one role. Yeah, I've seen that as well. Last question on this specific topic. So I'm curious because you have so many different types of people reporting up to you. Do you have a point of view on which roles should have incentive comp and or variable comp and which should just be, listen, this is your base salary, this is your job, or do all of them have some kind of variable component to them? I mean, in a perfect world, I would love... I think in a high growth startup, which even though we're 
you know, employee wise, we're beyond startup phase. We're still doubling revenue. Um, so we're still super high growth. I mean, in a perfect world, everybody has uh, some kind of bonus structure. I, I'm a big believer in like, you know, OKRs and stretch goals and incenting people to go, you know, above and beyond, you know, whatever it is um, that, they, that may be their goals. I think coming from a background of incentive comp, I think that's a good motivator. I don't necessarily think everyone should have like a 50-50 comp like a salesperson, um, but I do like the kind of incentive program. So that's like in a perfect world. But the reality is some, you know, some companies can't do that and some roles don't require it. But I always try to find if I can't do it from a, a comp perspective, either because of you know legal legal reasons, I do have a good percentage of um, non-exempt employees, um, then I try to do it in other ways, right? And so I try to find... You know, it's not the same as cash necessarily, but whether it could be stock or bonuses or spot awards or uh, prizes or recognition or something. But human beings in general are motivated by goals and by recognition. And so I think a you know, role should have some kind of incentive uh, program. Type. It just may not look and smell like commissions. I think that word that you mentioned, recognition, is really the key to it. I think that it's at every level. It's not even at the junior level, but everybody wants some level of recognition for the good work that they do. Yeah. It doesn't have to be cash. You don't have to recognize people like you sell a deal, you get a hundred bucks, right? It doesn't have to be cash. It can be, you know, an award. Awards are cheap, you know, like it's a piece of paper or a shout out, you know, but it can have the same psychological benefit as a commission check can. I know that, you know, in sales, we're constantly thinking of multiple ways of recognizing people outside of just commissions and I think that idea can be used across all departments, you know, even if you can't commission your employees. Yeah, I agree. We've got a little bit of time left. And one of the things I think a lot of people are wondering, at least I'm wondering, you're obviously an accomplished and incredible revenue leader, both on the sales side and the success side. Uh, you're also, of course, a woman. What advice do you have uh, or would you like to give to folks that are coming up through the ranks that are women? Because we're all talking about diversity. You know, it's sometimes putting into practice uh, seems more difficult, at least from the sales perspective, where, you know, trying to find great female leaders to promote and to be, make part of the executive team is a conscious effort. And from your perspective, I'm sure you're facing all kinds of challenges, all kinds of unconscious bias every day. So what advice would you give to, you know, the 23-year-old, the 24-year-old woman that's starting out her career in startups and how you managed it and what advice you would share with them? Yeah. So I would say I never really, it didn't even dawn on me, honestly. <laughs> like I would say until I became VP of sales that it even dawned on me that I was, not that I, obviously I knew I was a woman, right? But it never <laughs> dawned on me that there was like, that it would be something that even mattered, right? You know, I, my, in my early days, I just focused on, you know, getting my job done, achieving, you know, like at a high level of competency, you know, seeking out, you know, extra projects, I am looking for ways of adding value to the company. I just wanted to be a good employee, right? <laughs> like really. And I don't have I'm not I don't have a shy personality and so I was always willing to talk about my opinions and my beliefs and share them um, and wanted to get involved in multiple ways in the, you know around the organization so I could add more value. So my advice would be right, is is one speak up your voice is valued. Everyone's voice is valued. I mean, frankly, my advice for a woman would be the same as my advice for, for a man, but right, is like your opinion's valued, speak up, right? That's the first thing. The second one, maybe a little more women because I think women tend to beat themselves up more and tend to self-doubt more than men do, right? But like, you know, trust yourself, like, you know, trust your instinct. Don't doubt yourself. You'll make mistakes, you know, but learn from them um, versus having the mistake kind of prevent you from even failing again in the future. And I think that's pretty important. And then honestly, don't play the woman card and don't really emphasize the woman thing because someone asked me once a question, like in an interview, it said, um, how is it different being a, a female executive? And I was like, it's not. Like, I have goals. You have goals, right? I want to achieve my goals. You want to achieve your goals. With certain things we're expected to do as a leader, you know, manage our employees, um, you know, provide a great, you know, work environment, you know, achieve business goals. At the end of the day, it's the same. And so I tried, if you, if you put too much emphasis on the differences, I think it's going to actually do you a disservice and just focus on the things that are the same. I think that's good advice. 
last few questions so we can pay it forward a little bit. Tell us some of your mentors, some of your influences, maybe some of the books that had a big impact on you, some of the podcasts you're listening to, if we want to keep following the breadcrumb trail of the things that created and the influences that created El Scala. What are those things and who are those people? Sure. So let's say you've got books. I have a, uh, like an hour commute every day. So I'm now doing all my books audio. Um, so I get a lot of stuff read that way. I mentioned The Power of Moments. Um, I, that's a recent one. I just finished a fan of Radical Candor um, and Kim Scott's work there. So I just finished that and I just finished Work Rules. Love Extreme Ownership. That was one of my favorite um, books. I just think there's so much in the idea of like, like, especially in the startup world, right? Of truly owning the power of one just read that too, or not just, but that was uh, recently on my on my list. So those are probably the ones I read in the last four or five months that I that stood out to me. The um, podcasts. So I, I, I kind of flip flop with between podcasts and audiobooks on my commutes, and sometimes I want to do like mindless podcasts. <laughs> What is his name? Com- Trevor Noah from Trevor Noah, thank you. Comedy, Comedy Central. Central Daily Show. Like, Daily Show, yeah. So, like, sometimes you just want to you know, tune out a little bit from business books. Uh, right now, I like the um, the serial style mystery, you know, kind of real, you know, kind of crime story. So, I'm doing Atlanta Monster right now, which is another one of those serial type podcasts. But on the business side, Tim Ferriss, uh, Seeking Wisdom. Um, the radical candor that Kim Scott masters of scale, Reed Hoffman, I mentioned the Reed Hoffman one. And then I also looked through the, um, ANZ, the Andreessen Horowitz podcast. I think they have a pretty good one. So those are some of the business ones. Great. And then any mentors, any great people in startup land that we should be thinking about or following? Uh, I mean, I follow like the the typical ones. You know, when I first became a VP of sales, I actually asked Brendan Cassidy to be my mentor. I, he's been a great mentor to me in, in my early days of, of running sales. Um, you know, I, I follow the sort of typical people in the um, influencer category and the VC world, like your, your Jason Lumpkins or your David Scox in the customer success world, Lincoln Murphy, Nick Meta. So kind of the who's who, like nobody that you haven't heard before. And then obviously in terms of like, women, you know, Sheryl Sandberg. And you know, I, I absolutely, you know, look up to a lot of the strong women leaders that are making, you know, having a voice. I personally, from a mentor perspective, I like to have dozens of mentors that serve like a slightly different purpose. My, you know, like I have a really close friend who's a female CEO. And so when it comes to like female leadership and, you know, how is that my next step? She's the person I go to when it comes to sales stuff. I'll make call Brendan when it, you know, when it, it's a, I like having a dozen people I can go do for different things. I think that's great advice. Emmanuel, thank you so much for joining us today. If folks want to reach out to you, are you open to that? And what's your preferred channel? Sure. Um, so preferred would either be Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, okay. so you can connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter is at L Scala, E-L-L-E-S-K-A-L-A. Awesome. Thank you so much for participating. We will see you in the future and, uh, and I'll be in touch soon. Thanks again. Thanks, Sam. This is Sam's Corner. Great interview with Emmanuel Scala, VP of Success at Toast. Emmanuel really sheds a lot of light on the scale and complexity of a fully scaled customer success organization when you've got 850 people in the company. One of the other things that she pointed out, just for frame of reference, when you're evaluating NPS, so anything below zero, probably think about whether or not you should be scaling at all. Consider not investing in any further go-to-market if your NPS is below zero. Zero to 30, that's the yellow range. North of 30, maybe up to 50 or 60. That's the green. And then bright green is, is north of 50 or 60, maybe all the way up to 70. So when you're thinking about measuring net promoter score, uh, the other thing that Manuel mentioned, she does it every month. And she's looking at the comments, not just the score. She's tracking trend line and the score, but also looking specifically at the comments. Final thought, she's following up with every single person that leaves a comment positive or negative. So there's been some debate in the past whether that's appropriate. Emmanuel is saying do it regardless of positive or negative score. This has been Sam's Corner. Thanks so much for listening. To check out the show notes, see upcoming guests, and play more episodes from our incredible lineup of sales leaders, visit saleshacker.com slash podcast. You can also find the Sales Hacking Podcast on iTunes or Google Play. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a share on LinkedIn, Twitter, or any other social media platform. And finally, special thanks again to this month's sponsor at Node. See more at info.node.io forward slash sales hacker. Finally, if you want to get in touch with me, find me on Twitter at Sam F. Jacobs or on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash Sam F. Jacobs. I'll see you next time. Smile